Hello everyone, today we talk about Alexander's panoply based on the Isos mosaic that is, as you know, uh, a Roman copy from the house of the phone in Pompeii from, however, a contemporary painting uh, of Alexander and we will add also other, um, say, comparative sources, for example, the one in the tomb of Vergina that has been identified with the one of Saint Philip II, so the father of Alexander III, and also other um, ones such as, for example, the monument to Alcetas killed in Pisidian 320, but the same Alexander's sarcophagus that, as you know, was uh, created later, but still in in the age of the uh, the other coin. And the content would uh, lend itself actually to uh, an excursus also on the um, tombs of Macedonian kings and or other, in fact, Macedonian aristocratic graves uh, that naturally share many similarities also with uh, trace other, um, other parts of the Balkans uh, and that however belong to a bit more of a broader uh, time altogether we should select whether talking about the, the, the contemporaries of Alexander also in neighboring uh, countries because of course of the deep uh, Hellenic uh, influence um, on the on the entire region or the one of their uh, of, of Alexander's successors but the thing is a bit complicated it requires attention to many different sources we will mention for example some gorget from Thracian and the Traco Macedonian tradition for example we can uh, call it this way. Um, there is also another more ideological aspect that is properly what the arms of Alexander were treated like, you know, that um, there was a, a mystic uh, connected with, with Alexander, but also here in a broader sense, the Macedonians um, essentially practiced the same tumulus burial with arms on top. Th this tells you how influence was Macedon by the steppes culture through the uh, Danubian Valley uh, and more, but how still properly in this Indo-European background it was ingrained, the, the concept of, of the, again, celestial rulers and the equestrian tradition, and so this Apollonian, uh, you know, ideology, albeit, of course, it was all blended, it was part of the Dionysian one, especially in the case of Alexander, we find an important amount of that we'll see also, for example, the Medusa on, on the chest of Alexander's cuirass that was meant, um, in that sense, not much as a Dionysian um, symbolism for the wearer, but just uh, still the the idea that the enemy would be a weak one, uh, a Pelasgian one would be frozen, unlike the the Apollonian hero by the, the sight uh, of the Medusa and not being able. To, to counter it effectively and this kind of things um, Alexander's throne was uh, used uh, by the the other coin right as placed in the center of the assembly to, to take decisions because his presence was felt to be there um, Alexander corpse was placed in fact in at the center of the council by the signing of the succession so uh, a Macedonian king was a living presence beyond death course. Um, and there are many other interesting details that eventually get down to the to the broader um, uh, myth and but the, the the one of properly of the megas as such. So essentially the, the single most important thing that the world had ever witnessed. Um, and that would be essentially the Alec the Alexandrine um, obsession that not just the Greeks but also the Romans, pretty much everybody uh, had at the time, think about Caesar complaining, not being, you know, uh, having been able to, to succeed at some point of his life uh, where when Alexander had already conquered the, the, the world. Augustus, as you know, when, when he took over Egypt, visited Alexander's mausoleum, so that there was a, an enormous continuity with uh, Alexander's tradition that lived on in Christianity, even in Islam. In Islam, even more than in Christianity, interestingly enough, um, up to Far East Asia and so on. But this is not what this video is talking about, but just for telling you that the panoply here is not merely a, 
a material object. It's literally meant to be sacred. As we will see, for example, here there are no shields because especially on horseback, the Macedonians in this, um, especially the anti heroi and so basically what the also the kings were equivalent to, um, didn't didn't use one. Uh, they had uh, Axustan, as we will see now. Uh, of course, shields were used mostly in storming citadels and even hills and Alexanders, it's, as well as other Macedonian um, kings and generals, of course, is described wielding one. But, say, for example, Alexander's shield was believed at some point to have been the one of the temple of, of Athena at Ilium, right, and having uh, an Iliad legacy in that regard. So, um, it was really a war dominated by what we would call magic today, but that was essentially the, the entire point of existence uh, at the time, and that Alexander had magnified as the greatest conqueror in the history of mankind. Now, um, uh, the comparison with the companion cavalry, the Hethaeroi, is, is important because the Macedonian aristocracy was not just a feudal one, but in this sense uh, a relatively egalitarian one where, where the monarch was a primus inter pares um, and uh, shared all the perils and lifestyle of, of the, the, the rest of the nobility. And as you know, with also kind of detrimental habits, I mean, you know, uh, the liver of an average Macedonian nobleman was not exactly, you know, functional. And after all, the alcohol that was normally injected um, in the organism. Um, but it was functional, in fact, to that kind of life, lifestyle that was uh, traumatically short, brutal, and especially bloody. Right? We have to describe what essentially the Macedonian aristocracy really were. Obsessed with horses, with blood, and with divine transfiguration. And this was naturally incarnated in the Macedonian cavalry. There was the establishment of, of the kingdom and um, had the most dramatic shock impact in the Macedonian combined tactics. Were based, in fact, as you know, in kind of importantly packed formations. Essentially, the, the strongest cavalry uh, in in ancient uh, Europe, at least in the sedentary world, considering that if you don't, you, you can't have really a strong cavalry if you don't have a feudal society. So, even when you look at the uh, Romans, the Celts, the Germans, uh, they they were all obsessed. I mean, even the same Greeks with the, with their phalanxes were obsessed with cavalry. Think about the barbarians in their Cantabrian gallop. Um, the barbarians, geographically meant in that case, were mostly Celtic. Um, everybody was obsessed culturally, mythologically, etc., with horses, but fundamentally they didn't have a, a, a really feudal society. It doesn't matter how powerful the oligarchies were. Um, Macedon essentially tops it in, in that sense for the, the Western sedentaries. Um, and so their entire equipment was functionalized to this extreme shock uh, that, of course, had to make the the rider relying on, on his mount and vice versa in an indis in, indissoluble way. As centaurs, the same was for the collective training that these men underwent, again, in the most systematically brutal uh, and abusive ways uh, since their uh, childhood, fundamentally. And that made them these uh, essentially serial killers um, by default, just like their their greatest heroes, such as uh, Achilles, really obliged them, without any exception, to be. And that's how Alexander also conquered the world, which was not done exclusively by that. As you know, there was a lot of civilization there, um, not just through the Hellenic medium, but by the, the Macedonian reforms, um, Philip II's creation of, a, of an army capable of taking over the Achaemenid Empire and opening uh, your, the, the world to, to, to the European conquerors. Now, aside from, from this legacy, of course, we have to understand how Benel, the, the equipment was, was conceived. So we can start apparently from, you know, just from the visual evidence of the Issus mosaic from relatively, you know, this, this is not even weaponry 
arms or armor, right? Uh, the cloak, right? Alexander wears a white or pale gray long sleeve tunic and a light purple cloak. And this was pretty much standard for the Macedonian companion cavalry. Long sleeve tunic, cloak, and short boots are from uh, depicted from Alexander's sarcophagus, though other sources show short sleeves. Um, the Egyptian painting of uh, Alcetas shows also white tunic uh, for an unarmed horseman, and um, this can be compared also with, with Alexander's, um, and a red-brown cloak, right? And a figure behind the same Alexander on the mosaic, in fact, has a sandy brown cloak, while Dionysus of Alicarnaxus mentions the dun cloak of one of Pyrrhus' cavalry in the following century. Uh, and so we understand that this broader Macedonian world, white tunics and some sort of dull brown cloak may have been somewhat uniform and or you know, represented some specific um, characteristics. Um, whiteness especially having a lot to do with the, um, that's with the elite. Uh, of um, of the Apollonian, you know, hierarchy. Um, we know from Diodorus that Alexander issued his Etairoi with uh, purple-bordered cloaks after he took Persepolis, that was the spiritual capital of the Persian Empire. And purple, as you know, was always associated with the imperial power. It uh, represented blood by a certain degree it's, uh, itself. And so the, the maximization of, of life, right? Just like blood is, is the life. And um, a tomb painting of the same era shows a, a Macedonian officer, in this case perhaps an infantryman, telling the truth, in red tunic. Sometimes these men, uh, even kings, dismounted to fight. It, this is true for Alexander um, himself. And so mm, officers in that regard didn't probably differed much in equipment. Um, they could exchange like or adapt their um, armament naturally for you know functionalizing to foot or or horse com a mounted combat but let's say uh, this white linen cuirass, sandy cloak decorated in purple um, well it fits perfectly with the aforementioned uh, references and thus seems there to, to have embodied something something greater. This is very interesting because there is this episode in which Alexander gets wounded uh, at a siege famously enough, uh, and here he, he looked at his wound, at his blood and said, then then I can't bleed, I'm a mortal, right? And so the whiteness, you know what he said, that normally red was common among, I don't know, the Spartans, the Romans, that naturally used also other colors, including white, um, was maybe there to kind of uh, avoid showing the blood but these people were obsessed with blood, right? So, and the idea rather was the, the concept that the, the perfect hero would, wouldn't, couldn't even be wounded by a certain degree. So wearing white was a way to contrast that purity with the massive rain of blood that naturally was uh, proper of what ancient warfare really was like, that it was exclusively pure butchery and nothing else right so the um the, the there is almost a sadistic but you know sense of accomplishment in that idea of seeing yes you know a beautiful white tunic spurted in blood uh to really stress the the necessity of that just like sacrifices before the battle and 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 so on uh that were quite quite gory for sure now what is naturally very interesting about the entire um, mosaic depiction is the cuirass of Alexander. Um, this, as we will see now, this is pretty similar to the one found at the tomb of Vergina, seemingly having belonged to, to Alexander's father. Then um, there are there is a debate about this uh, because some pieces are, are, do we have anything that really belonged to Alexander in arms and armor? Um, we th we think not, right? Some have proposed that even I think the same part of the same Virginia panoply may have uh, included elements of uh, eventually of Alexander's armor, etc. But it's quite unlikely. We know that Alexander's armor circulated 
uh, there were some Diadochoi that literally wore uh, Alexander's armor as a, you know, as in fact as a sort of magic um, panoply that could confer um, supernatural powers. Um, and so there was all, um, you know, a, uh, an interest in a in a mythology and properly a cult of these pieces, but we don't seem to have anything from that. What we realized, though, is that our knowledge of Macedonian arms and armor, and so also what could have been worn by kings and and and, and other aristocrats, uh, is pretty known, right? And we will see now by which degree, right? The, the cuirass that appears on the mosaic is reinforced with iron scales, right, about the waist and what seems to be a rectangular iron plate on the chest, bearing a gorgon's head, as we were, um, we were saying before. Um, the shoulder yoke may also be of iron, right, as, so for, for most um, arms and armor in antiquity, uh, what we see is the, also in the Middle Ages, we made several videos about arms and armor. Um, recently, the one about lamellar, like it's, you know, it's the design of the armor that counts in a sense um, as the type of armor uh, and the degree of protection that you can afford with that structure. But the the material can vary dramatically, and with that, also, of course, also the quality of the uh, of the armor itself. The reason why there is so much trouble in essentially even determining what kind of material these cuirasses were, first of all, is that uh, we have a very few of them surviving, but also we realized that there was such an enormous variety in, in not much in the design, but in the composition, right? Also the design changed, nothing was truly uniform in, in the contemporary sense. It really, not even today, re it, it really is, especially when we talk about a panoply, right? Soldiers go in combat with very different gear, even within the same unit, you know, having the same function of one another, so there's a lot of personalization, customization. The point though is that these arms and armor in um, in such faraway times are represented in ways that we can't tell what material this, this thing is. Uh, even when it's colored, it's painted, as we'll see now, as it was dramatically frequent, because all this was normally, all dramatically colorful, right? Um, it doesn't tell us, right, what, what kind of material it really was. So, like, um, what we call the linothorax as that specific kind of Hellenic derived uh, or Hellenic associated rather um, type of armor. It could be literally just of linen, or it could have the, uh, the 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 metal armor, as you know, within it, interspersed in part, etc. So it, conceptually, it's not different. What you start seeing how also plate armor develops in the Middle Ages at some point, and you just can't even see what's under the linen, or whether it's the, the metal is painted, and so on. What we understand, of course, um, as you were saying before, is that most of, you know, say, the, the, uh, the, the top kind of uh, tactical role that especially the, the Macedonian king would, would have was the one of heavy cavalrymen. And so these were essentially the single most armored men in the army. Their tactical role was strictly subordinated to that slow but steamrolling kind of uh, cavalry charge would essentially destroy energy in front of them um, in a very prepared moment of the battle, let's say. Uh, naturally, as we've seen, uh, a sinking could become a stormtrooper. As it was also normal, actually, for heavy cavalry, because they were very often the same men that this, during sieges dismounted and, and assaulted. This is true also for the Middle Ages and so on. Um, the lighter troops just served to blockade, but the, the, the storming requires, just for the sheer amount of, of, of energies that it requires, a level of athleticism and of training that objectively only the nobility really had. Um, compared to, to the mass of the troops that naturally could do that and would do that too, but just mostly following these men. So it's obvious that this kind, and paradoxically, yes, the heaviest kind of armor was needed in, even in that situation because, you know, climbing a ladder while they, they throw stones at you, it may be exhausting physically speaking with an armor 
like that is also the only possible way you can anybody can do that right as a path opener by the way and so the best protection would be ensured this um, in many ways um, the uh, shoulder pieces bear a white thunderbolt motive which was naturally the uh, the symbol of Zeus so the godfather and of all the you know the, the Apollonian universal religion the wall cuirass is quite interestingly similar with the one of the Virgin at home um, as the 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 piece consists of thin iron plates four for the body and two for each sh shoulder hinged where they joined and then there was a back plate with a rectangular extension for the back of the neck uh, which was kind of normal to see it even in you know the typical hopolitic linothorax even was was useful really for any fighter um, but there is then this breastplate leaving the upper chest uncovered um, naturally there are some uh, debates relative with how much these um, panoplies were properly designed for combat some were some weren't in any case in the Virginia home you see the iron covered inside with cloth and outside with cloth and leather and thus uh, at least in a, an iconographic dimension that as we've seen would uh, hide kind of the the true consistence uh, the true substance of the uh, of the armor the covering of the Virginia tomb one is is white specifically and aside from the color symbolism you understand that white uh, deflects uh, sun rays doesn't absorb them like like darker colors and just um, say a metal um, like iron uh, absorbs um, dramatically the the radiations and the 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 heating increases dramatically so it was very important to isolate also the the heavier armor with these kind of other organic material uh, coverings this complicates altogether our understanding of, of the design of this armor because for example some choruses are shown with scales down to the sides but not the front right so um, it seems likely that, that a crucial area like the front where also these men mostly directed their existence at each other um, may have been protected by a concealed metal plate rather than left unreinforced right however consider also the costs of, of, of this armor and um, it's possible that what is, um, is shown here like essentially a, as an iron corselet may have um, been the simpler version worn among the, the lighter troops you know that even among the, the phalangites the just the first ranks were heavily armored the other ones tended to be lighter and this is true generally speaking for all um, ancient medieval formations in general right uh, a commander may have also wanted to have the least armored in, in the in the front ranks because that's how you decide to to compose the, the formation but generally speaking that's that, that's the tendency especially for all the the held at the frontal ranks of the phalanx had normally to 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 undergo now the Virginia cuirass had also a narrow gold band with relief decorations at all edges which naturally was uh, hyper expansive and classy let's say and, and a broader band around the center of the body as well on the front there were installed six small gold lion's heads four with rings through the mouth to hold the laces which fastened down to the shoulder pieces so quite artistic but also quite delicate by a certain degree all these armor generally speaking have tarugas um, and in the case of this upper you know, even aristocrats um, there were important decorations in the case of Virginia we have 56 um, gold strips specifically which um, 
indicates numerically two layers decorated uh, in relief and ending in palmette by the way so you have this white and gold and it looks impressive right it's literally the colors of celestial power gold like the sun white like purity and so this absolute superiority of divine of divine nature um, the uh, th there is a, a statue a bronze statue um, at Naples that is believed to be a copy of a contemporary work as well and this one um, shows a short plate cuirass with Pterugas uh, as well the Isis mosaic shows knotted round Alexander's waist a narrow green sash edged and fringed in yellow and black right um, and support a common emblem of officers rank in the Macedonian army so naturally also some kind of um, customization in colors symbolism would become traditional on the base in fact of whether Alexander himself had um, used it um, or not um, because these colors were naturally believed to own a power on their own and uh, psychology tells us that yes different colors have an effect on the wearer importantly enough and this in in warfare does correspond to some kind of uh, fact different um, different shades different characters that generally speaking also units acquire you know all, all units more or less they had their own insignia their own colors because that was supposed to um, to indicate very far from uniformity actually a very specific character of that unit that was in that sense also to be employed in possibly in some cases in differ different tactical roles speaking of griefs the Virginia Tomb uh, rendered us four pairs one the left grieve an inch shorter than the right uh, one to accommodate Philip's limp was gilded naturally every armor was designed on the wearers uh, anthropometry and even more so uh, the one of, of the king uh, of Macedon so er, this makes every armor unique naturally there was some degree of standardization for average height and so on uh, at a point if you want to protect yourself in battle you just pick wh whatever you find uh, from, from the field but in general the uh, ergonomy and um, the, the anatomy properly of, of the design um, is, is crucial because every piece fits with, with the rest so naturally having uh, a, a, an armor set a panel plate that was properly designed entirely by the same armor and with this degree of accuracy speaks of the dramatic quality uh, of the same speaking of footwear the bronze statue uh, at uh, Naples shows high sandals um, that are also believed to be a copy of a contemporary work from which the the, the model was was uh, created so contemporary to to Alexander uh, for that matter um, and speaking of Virginia Tombs we see open to boots shown uh, from an hunting scene painted on the facade of, of the mausoleum both the Isis mosaic and the Naples bronze show Alexander bareheaded this was uh, naturally an older tradition deriving from the concept that the true hero really goes at war without any armor of sort and so going I into battle without helmet would have been somewhat suicidal uh, given all the possible imaginable things that would land on you and most of which wouldn't make much of a damage um, we know Alexander from his uh, military uh, records having been struck in the head his helmets being damaged etc but the helmet naturally was one of the most important pieces of the panoply not just because of the defense function of the most vulnerable part of the body but also the literally the head the body and all the, the, that that it symbolized in this kind of Iron Man um, design so the idea is you know showing uh, Alexander 
and also allowing him to be recognized. What was an important deal? That there were many instances. Think about Pyrrhus. Uh, think about the same. I don't know William the Conqueror at Hastings. At some point uh, during battles, these uh, commanders went into pretty intense fighting. Banners could fall. Voices could run that the boss had died or been captured, and so on. So this man had to run sometimes in front of, of the battle line with all the risks and involved to respirit the army, to show, look, I'm alive. This doesn't necessarily mean that they would have to take their helmet off to properly show the word that it was them, which may be difficult, right? But th the point was having a, a unique helmet that would render you available without taking it off. So a great importance was naturally attached to the art uh, of the same. Um, one aspect that would distinguish Alexander in starting a trend uh, in ancient history and warfare, as you know, was that he shaped, right? And this innovation, given that the Macedonian aristocracy wore a, a beard instead, was widely copied, uh, especially among the, the Adokoi, so the younger generations and their successors in turn. You know that Scipio Africanus also had in his Hellenism a quite Alexandrine uh, taste, and so he shaved, and that's uh, basically not until Hadrian that Romans wore beard throughout all the, even their political life, not just as warriors and so on. So there were these fashions that uh, went back and forth, um, also for non-military reasons, like in... Um, in Hadrian's case and, and successor, there was more of like a philosophic, broader philosophical and already more modern, secularized um, meaning to the one that, uh, that even physical appearance, in fact, with long hair or beard was, was attached to in kind of more archaic primitive times. Um, you know, that hair was also properly a symbol of, of power of the warrior. This is present in many cultures from the Jewish to the Germanic one um, and so on. And great importance was attached to physical beauty because um, people had to to be genetically superior in the order of, of nature to rule over others. They thought literally that these were descendants of the, you know, of, of fallen gods, but that the, these were humans and mortals who were closer to the original divine race. So the more archaic the culture was and the, the more they attached importance to this, but this was pretty much alive also in high medieval Europe still. So that's how deeply they they really cared. But helmets were naturally used by Alexander um, and as we were saying before also referenced to often in the sources. Um, there's another source that is a coin showing Alexander fighting Porus with um, one reverse figure of Alexander standing. I split it um, in, the, in the video here, there are some images of that. And both versions on the coin show what is clearly revealed in enlarged um, photographs as a high-crowned Thracian helmet with crest in vertical ornaments, apparently um, standing feathers. Th there is also an interesting symbology attached to that, such as the glory, of course, coming to Alexander and all this uh, celestial uh, connection and so on. But as far as the helmet uh, is concerned, this is this is important. Um, the this is sarcophagus and mosaic show Boeotian helmets for the Ethiroi, by the way. Uh, one apparently painted white with a golden wreath painted on. Um, and painted helmets were very common, really, um, at the time. Everything was like almost lacquered. Like I, I don't know if you've seen ever replicas of medieval helmets. They, they, they just looked like modern motorcycle colored helmets. Right? The, the effect visually is the same. And these were very polished, too, to shine uh, in the sun. Um, uh, we may think this Thracian helmet we described uh, from the coin may be the style Alexander wore specifically at the Granicus river uh, because we have the the, uh, the accounts on 
some characteristics of this helmet. Uh, and particularly the fact that it, it had a, a white feather on each side. At Gaugamela, Alexander's helmet was instead polished iron with a gorget attached. Uh, this latter detail is important because we know just two types of gorgets from this broader Hellenistic um, era. Um, uh, one was the higher kind of a more enveloping type recommended by Xenophon. I think we described it also in the video about the Athenian cavalry or organization. Uh, and this was uh, even a, as a sort of amen tail because it could cover the face up to, to the nose, right? So it was very, uh, very protective and considered that, that this is a, an overlooked aspect of generally speaking arms and armor in ancient medieval times, how much, of course, in how important the area going from your your nose to your to your chest really was. Um, so to try to join it with pieces that normally the island tail, um, in that sense also with different layers also of, the, of chest armor and helmet overlapping on, under it, and, and, and this kind of solutions would, would help, in fact, protecting what was one of the, if not the main target, right? It's just not different from, from today's where people are told to shoot at uh, in, uh, in uh, targets in the army, right? You, you basically, you don't, you don't look for headshots, you just aim at, at the chest. And if you're lucky, you know, also because the burst may, you know, t tends to, to, to move the, the gun um, upwards, you will, you will shoot, say, the neck, the head, uh, and so on. It's the idea of two shots at the, at the chest and uh, one at the neck to sewer the, the nerves. Um, for preventing, you know, a dying uh, enemy to, to, to connect brain and, and arms to keep shooting and doing some things. This is told also, in fact, at especially close range um, shooting. Um, as we were saying before, when you charge and with these systems that are mass things, you, of, you often hold with, with both arms, and then you normally aim at the guy's chest and the the, the hit may reach the face as well, which is the same reason why in such normally frontal kind of feudal warfare attacks, you see it in medieval times when eventually the, 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 the great helm encloses the world face. Um, you literally need to protect that. You have such narrow eyes lids that uh, almost don't, don't make you see anything, but it's better that than, you know, uh, as it still happened, by the way, to, to get a, a lens in, into your eye. And naturally, um, ancient cavalry uh, did charge and also with devastating effect and so on, but much less strongly than would, what, what medieval cavalry would. Um, and as a consequence, probably there was less emphasis on this kind of even facial pr protection uh, by a degree. And that's why we don't see too much of that, except in cultures that were more feudally advanced than this one, such as in Central Asia and the steppes, you find a lot of that kind of, a, because they procure literally what would have been injected even in fact during the migration era into Europe as well, uh, during the Middle Ages again to revive these cultures that had or come from there um, uh, back in the day. And um, as a consequence, um, we we also wonder how these pieces were constructed because the one described by Xenophon fits with the uh, with examples here uh, of the Macedonian aristocracy because these do not seem to have had a, a gorget uh, attached to to the helmet particularly. The other type of gorget is um, proper of some archaic Thracian um, finds that are also similar, in fact, to, to the Macedonian ones. We we we, we will see now. Um, Still, with you know, connected to a type of mm, panoply with say muscular uh, cuirasses, still in a face where, um, in fact, the same hoplite um, armor was very uh, heavy, right? Reminiscence of the Bronze Age kind of uh, properly blinding, uh, you know, extend extenuant armors that. Um, However, we're still functional to that type uh, of fighting. And albeit the heavier panoplies disappeared, gorgets remained in this area. Um, 
there, right, in, in some ways. There are two examples dating from the second half of the fourth century um, for from the Maltepa Tumulus and Vurbitsa. So we are in Alexander's time, by the way. And there is also Macedonian grave specifically having uh, a gorget of similar shape um, and uh, date. And in these examples, the throat and upper chest were covered by a crescent-shaped gorget of silver, plated, gilded, uh, iron, um, sometimes eventually de decorated with bands of relief or ornamentation. Again, these were for heavy troopers that had, in fact, uh, money to spend and status to, to boast also on the battlefield. Um, and the Macedonian examples are not associated with the older cuirasses. In fact, it's not even clear what armor was worn um, with this type of gorget um, after the, again, the heavier kind of panoply was already um, gone, right, uh, by, by that generation's time, right. And naturally, if we look at other combinations, because especially more backwards areas, like even traced by a certain degree, were, in spite of the context with the most updated armor that in fact was also used, but still display this kind of archaisms, um, tend to be more conservative, right? In Beroes, south of the Balkan Mountains, we find scale armor in the first century BC that was also kind of more common in the north. The trace, as you know, was more kind of steppe influence, McQuestion influence, but there were letter cuirasses as well and also uh, muscled cuirasses um, around for longer times. So this is possible naturally as well for Macedonian times as well. So the idea that the mus muscular cuirass is what we call this kind of old uh, big plate armor fundamentally um, by splitting two pieces normally would um, uh, would be impossible to wear or excessive or too expensive. Really? Right? You know, humans are always the same. The, the reason why they had worn that, and actually much, much heavier stuff than that before, that means that it can be used and it does offer some protection. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, these top generals would, would also wear it on some occasions, not just parades and so on, but because they were important to protect um, as people in the first place. Before passing to weapons we can add the fact that Alexander's Gaugamela gear also included uh, a captured Persian linen cuirass, a Sicilian tunic and an ornate Rhodian cloak. So quite of a you know mix there. Um, and of course it's normal that aside from this uh, fashions that you see here in the broader Atlantic world, you would have also uh, equipment uh, taken from the, the, the enemy. And th there were really the, the wildest kind of combinations. We can maybe, when we will talk about the companions equipment, etc., we will see very, very interesting things. Here we stick just to what we think specifically Alexander could have Worn in specific occasions on the base of archaeology and historiography and, and so on. Um, the helmet on the Alexander sarcophagus was made years after his death, so we don't really take uh, Alexander's sarcophagus, sarcophagus per se as such a direct evidence. Uh, in any case, this one is shaped like a lion's head, which is an animal symbolism that we found also in Philip grave um, and traces of yellow paint because of course all monuments were colored as well suggest uh, it was supposed to represent polished bronze or gilded uh, and the there is no trace in that case of fittings for crests that telling the truth were pretty normal especially among the Macedonian companion cavalry. For example, the sarcophagus and mosaic show Boeotian helmets. One apparently painted white and with golden red painted on, so again the white and gold as 
perhaps the dominating um, color, uh, at least of, of the elite, uh, as such. Uh, painted helmets, as we've seen, were common. Um, crests, as we were just saying, uh, which were perhaps standard for Macedonian cavalry, right? Then ar artistic depictions may even not display those specifically. Um, in the Issus mosaic you even find a fallen attic helmet, albeit this may have been Persian. And of course the Achaemenids did use lots of uh, Hellenic um, arms and armor as well, not just because there were uh, hoplites in the Achaemenid army, uh, Greek mercenaries specifically, but because they also had been open to to the Atlantic world, as we were just discussing yesterday. The white feathers were worn also by Pyrrhus. Consider that also the Virgin at Homs, of course, gives us a, a helmet, which um, we think was, was gilded. And iron was increasingly used for armor this time, uh, after the, the, the mid 4th century, you know that this is also because more troops were armored because iron is really cheaper than than bronze. But in fact, bronze that also has some better qualities um, remain commoner beyond the end of of this very period. This, this is true also for for the Roman equipment and so on. Um, and the helmet at Vergina has tra both Thracian and Attic f features, right? And the latter, especially as we've seen, being uh, as felt to be as common as, as far as uh, the the Achaemenid Empire, even before uh, Alexander's conquest. Uh, and in the Virgina helmet, you see no signs of fittings for a horse crest atop uh, the high flat iron comb. Albeit, this is just a specific type of helmet. As we were saying before, shields are not so prominently figuring, especially in mounted combat. And I don't know whether there have been reconstructions of the shield um, in Virginia Tomb. I, I think so by this point. And it was traditionally, it was like a traditional aspis uh, with a plain bronze cover to protect it. Um, so this would have been still part of the broader panoply and of course every Macedonian nobleman was perfectly trained to fight with that. Um, the one of Virgina has an outer rim decorated with a spiral meander pattern and ivory and dark glass so again uh, very very refined uh, covered with a gold leaf even. And then inside was another band of gold and silver, mm, possibly pattern, and the center of the shield was gilded as well. There were two ivory figures attached, um, a youth seizing a maiden, so the typical kind of conqueror, say male conqueror of the uh, uh, f feminine, uh, feminine world, so the, the northern conqueror over the southern um, Pelasgians, let's say, it was the forever kind of uh, dynamic that was kept alive by these uh, people's uh, mythologies and existential purpose. Um, inside the shield was uh, a large rectangular gold plaque, decorated again with two pairs of lions, and the porpax was probably attached to them as we've seen before also for the pieces of the armor these were used to hinge to, to with with their rings um, the the various in this case the, the straps and arra arranged around it perhaps in a cross there were four golden bands bearing victories in relief and ending in palmet so the palm of victory and, and so on um, this entire shield uh, uh, is evidently ceremonial Right, it indicates, however, the use of a political style 
wants by the Macedonian troops, right? Uh, there is no doubt about that. I mean, whatever you see uh, represented, as we've seen, even the armor with all its um, extra elaboration, but essentially the same type of armor was, was worn by, used by the Macedonians. And of course, uh, the aspis was used um, pretty much by everyone. There is even nothing too much specific. We have explained that you don't have to fight in a political formation, you know, that kind of developed in a different way in Macedon. It was a bit of a different country from, from Greece. Um, and um, in any case, it, it does seem clear instead that this shield was supposed to be the one used by the dismounted um, and so properly the infantry fighting uh, general king in this case uh, this is surely true for Alexander etc they would always have their shield bearers um, that were also as you know specific units called like that I made a video especially about the Antigonid army these were corps that uh, took the name after some kind of feudal ballet kind of mansions and that instead were, in fact, like in many cultures, the, the most privileged and best equipped and, and most equipped, by the way, better armed, uh, best armed troops ever. So the shield bearer just meant you were the, essentially the, 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 the nobleman's squire and the king squire specifically speaking of the core so uh, this may have reflected this idea that you know the 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 Macedonian nobleman wouldn't even bring a shield on horseback normally which could still happen by the way but in this heavier type just concentrating on the on the charge and this tells you by far how already very collectively advanced this the, the the Macedonian tactics were um, in it again in fact a feudal society that is sen essentially has a professional military elite that fights and exercises just in that kind of combat of taking each other out um, just at the impact and uh, and then when they would dismount there was always somebody either riding or running uh, say riding most likely um, after them with some extra weapons, arms and armor, including a shield that could serve on, on foot because of course the existence on foot was uh, uh, say not useless but uh, this kind of literal pikes at the end of the day were functional just in uh, you know formations such as the phalanx and so not for individual combat where you would have passed as you'll see now to the sword and in going into single combat because that's what the hero was, was meant uh, to do. So speaking of weapons, offensive weapons, um, on the Isis mosaic you find a short straight sword on a red baldric and a long spear, the Xistan. Uh, the Xistan uh, is properly the, the spear, like uh, it, Normally, the, the most common name would be the Doru, but the Xistan um, also once generally uh, terming a spear shaft at, from this area onwards was uh, essentially used just to call the, the spears for the Macedonian style shock cavalry that also, in fact, was imitated by, by other powers, also mainly through the Diadokoi, but also among the Hellenic city states. Was Aristocracies were increasing power and imitating these ones of the major the feudal landlords of, of Macedonian and her conquered uh, kingdoms. Uh, later on, Arian even equates the Xistan with a larger, long, heavy contest, properly of the, the one was used by the peoples of the steppes. Uh, if we look at the iconography of Macedonian cavalry b before Philip II, we actually see um, a usual pair of light spears. Um, meaning, of course, we, we made a video about Thessalian cavalry that by a degree in, in more archaic classical times was, not naturally today we're talking about Hellenistic ones, um, was lighter, right? Cavalry was young, it was just essentially functionalized as, as the arm that we know by the 
the, the beginning of the first millennium BC. And it took time before it kind of deeply impacted uh, and uh, the, you know, tactics and properly perfected it, its use. In any case, these peoples were, as we've seen, some of the most, uh, definitely the most equestrianly proficient of the broader Lenic world, especially Macedon uh, through Thrace and the Scythians was uh, potently uh, influenced by mounted warfare. Um, and this is really uh, the point, and uh, there was the, the main deal was the shock of, of cavalry rather than other en engagements per se. And um, several long spears of exact length and certain naturally w were part of the Macedonian equipment. Another tumulus in the Vergina uh, mausoleum, because we're talking about Aigai, today is called Vergina. It was the older capital of Macedon, and, and there are several tombs, and we, we don't know exactly also uh, who um, was who there. Um, in fact, even Philip's uh, identity was, in that sense, uh, indicated for the main tomb in the, like in the 70s, I think, or the 20th century. And in any case, uh, another uh, tomb in the tumulus contains a spear with iron head and butt spike in the shaft completely encased in gold. These two, again, it, are very, not necessarily ceremonial, but celebrative weapons. And javelins were also found. So you understand that, of course, the Macedonian aristocracy in, in Alexander's time was, was still trained, like they would always remain, telling the truth, in ancient times with any kind of weapon. They could skirmish, they could charge frontally. So it was th their prerogative. In a feudal culture, the elite is trained with everything to fight in every single damned condition. Because it's a highly um, mm, hierarchized uh, society, right? Uh, that's why probably also the, the nature of Macedonian warfare is deeply different actually from the, the Hellenic classical one. They're not just the one the evolution of, of the other. Um, so the existence was probably the, the main weapon. Um, in the um, the Alexander uh, mosaic and on the porous coin, we see the single trusting spear about three meters and a half long. On the sarcophagus, there are attachment holes showing the metal spears which once adorned it. Right, and this makes us understand they were similar in length to the one depicted. So they were probably those ones, long spears, uh, being shown also in several other iconographic sources. Um, the existence also has probably nothing to do with the Sarissa, um, and uh, given that, uh, even though it wasn't that long, uh, even up to eight meters, it's normally believed it probably was just something like between four a half and five and a half meters. Well, this still is too long for the uh, for the cavalry. Um, the bat spike surviving on the Alcetas mosaic um, allows us to to measure the length of the spear with certainty, but much of the shaft is missing as well, and it's gr also gripped well back of of the middle. So um, we think as the Sarissa in a way that the same mm, in fact, cavalry spears may have had a weight on the back to, to balance the, the one of, of, of the hand, which, by the way, it tells you, uh, consider it's already difficult, like it, it requires a lot of training to be proficient with a, s such long weapons just as an infantryman, just imagine on horseback. And so the degree of professionalism that, that the Macedonian elite re really had. There are replicas um, of this also in some museums that have been used for testing and all this stuff. But in any case, that's mostly what we um, get about its dynamics is also kind of clear in the essentials. Then with weapons, you can literally do everything you want 
Everybody does. You can throw the legs. You can. Uh, a, a weapon can be used in the most, even irrational ways in in the heat of combat. In any case, um, speaking at least of how this the existence was made, well, mm, the shaft in cornel wood, the cornus mass, the cornelian cherry, uh, that was apparently common in Macedon at that time. Um, and this w seemingly gave an edge to Macedonian cavalry against the even the heavy Persian one that was generally speaking still relying importantly on javelins and shorter uh, spears. Aside from naturally one of possible allied contingents from the steppes, uh, the sakas, etc. But those were never like prominent in in Achaemenid. Uh, Ecumenic cavalry in general, um, and this means also that it, such long weapons, however, could be more prone to breakage, uh, and the bat spike would be used, as it was preferred, it seems, to the sword um, by some, right? Uh, albeit Plutarch says that Alexander relied on his sword as his principal weapon, which is very interesting because it also suggests kind of a more wrestling kind of uh, grappling type of fight, right? And uh, and speaking of swords, both the uh, the, the the straight one, uh, the, the generic xiphos, let's say, even though the semantics could be larger than the straightness of the of, of the blade but also the corpus that as you know was a, an excellent uh, cavalry weapon like almost a sort of saber but a bit more compact was was used uh, and again chopping limbs it's a cutting heads was absolutely the norm for which the ethiroi were were trained um, when we look at the uh, the Isis mosaic, we see also the horse with a bridle of gilt of bronze plagues. And what is visible of the saddle cloth is yellow with black markings, perhaps representing leopard skin. That was uh, a typically Dionysian symbol. As you know, the leopard was... Um, was signifying a bit the, the Dionysian, the Aphrodisian um, uh, fact, uh, religion that also Alexander was quite sensitive to next to, to the Apollonian one. And that also had that obvious kind of initiatic sense, like the idea that you have to wear to kill this animal to, to become one, and starting from the lower hierarchy of the lesser beings, that is the animals, to eventually become a, a human and then to transfigure into God again. Um, and so these forces were awakened, right? And there was surely there uh, an Oriental mystique uh, connected with the, with the, in fact, this idea of the East as the the seat of of these ketonic forces that needed to be dominated, such as by drinking so much wine, as it was common in the Macedonian aristocracy, but were also somewhat pervasive. Um, in a way, and the bridle seems to be knotted at the front, also in the mosaic, but there it, it is damaged, and so we base ourselves on the Naples statue rather. Um, for the rest, the scabbard uh, that is not shown here could be reconstructed by Philip's one, ideally like in made of wood and ivory, even. Um, Philip's sword was of the straight type with the guard covered in gold and two gold bands on, on the pommel, so quite elaborated. Um, as a ceremonial weapon, or at least a particularly decorated one, in, in any case, um, this is more or less what the, the picture that we can draw, ideally of Alexander's panoply. We will talk more specifically also about Philip's one uh, at a point and about arms and armor, Macedonian um, warriors and uh, and more 
really, because there is really a lot to tell on the base of this info, and uh, there is also, like, archaeology goes on, by the way, so on these details, it's definitely very, uh, very useful. Um, at this point, however, I stop it here. I just um, hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.